Myself and my two brothers once owned a schooner rig smack of about 70 tons burthen, with which we were in the habit of fishing among the islands beyond Moscow and nearly to Verg. In all violent eddies at sea, there is good fishing at proper opportunities, if one has only the courage to attempt it. But among the whole of the Lafaden coastmen, we three were the only ones who made a regular business of going out to the islands, as I tell you. The usual grounds are a great way lower down than the southward. There, fish can be got at all hours without much risk, and therefore, these places are preferred. The choice spots over here among the rocks, however, not only yield the finest variety, but in far greater abundance, so that we often got in a single day what the more timid of the craft could not scrape together in a week. In fact, we made it a matter of desperate speculation, the risk of life standing instead of labor, and courage answering for capital. We kept the smack in a cove about five miles higher up the coast than this, and it was our practice in fine weather to take advantage of the 15 minutes slack to push across the main channel of the Muscostrum far above the pool and then drop down upon anchorage somewhere near Otterholm or Sandflissen, where the eddies are not so violent as elsewhere. Here we used to remain until nearly time for slack water again when we weighed and made for home. We never set out upon this expedition without a steady side wind for going and coming one that we felt sure would not fail us before our return, and we seldom made a miscalculation upon this point. Twice during six years, we were forced to stay all night at anchor on account of a dead calm, which is a rare thing indeed just about here, and once we had to remain on the grounds nearly a week, starving to death, owing to a gale which blew up shortly after our arrival and made the channel too boisterous to be thought of. Upon this occasion, we should have been driven out to sea in spite of everything, for the whirlpools threw us round and round so violently that at length we fouled our anchor and dragged it, if it had not been that we drifted into one of the innumerable cross-currents, here today and gone tomorrow, which drove us under the lee of Flemen, where, by good luck, we brought up. I could not tell you the twentieth part of the difficulties we encountered on the grounds, it is a bad spot to be in, even in good weather, but we made shift always to run the gauntlet of the Muscostrum itself without accident, although at times my heart has been in my mouth when we happened to be a minute or so behind or before the slack. The wind sometimes was not as strong as we thought it at starting, and then we made rather less way than could wish, while the current rendered the smack unmanageable. My eldest brother had a son eighteen years old, and I had two stout boys of my own. These would have been of great assistance at such times in using the sweeps, as well as afterward in fishing, but somehow, although we ran the risk ourselves, we had not the heart to let the young ones get into danger, for, after all is said and done, it was a horrible danger, and that is the truth. It is now within a few days of three years since what I am going to tell you occurred. It was on the 10th day of July a day which the people of this part of the world will never forget, for it was one in which blew the most terrible hurricane that ever came out of the heavens. And yet all morning, and indeed until late in the afternoon, there was a gentle and steady breeze from the southwest, while the sun shone brightly so that the oldest seamen among us could not have foreseen what was to follow. The three of us, my two brothers and myself, had crossed over to the islands about 2 o'clock p.m., and had soon nearly loaded the smack with fine fish, which, we all remarked, were more plenty that day than we had ever known them. It was just seven by my watch when we weighed and started for home, so as to make the worst of the strom at slack water, for which we knew would be at eight. We set out with a fresh wind on our starboard quarter, and for some time spanked along at a great rate, never dreaming of danger, for indeed we saw not the slightest reason to apprehend it. All at once, we were taken aback by a breeze from over Helsegen. This was most unusual, something that had never happened to us before, and I began to feel a little uneasy without exactly knowing why. 
We put the boat on the wind, but could make no headway at all for the eddies, and I was upon the point of proposing to return to the anchorage, when, looking astern, we saw the whole horizon covered with a singular copper-colored cloud that rose with the most amazing velocity. In the meantime, the breeze that had headed us off fell away, and we were dead becalmed, drifting about in every direction. This state of things, however, did not last long enough to give us time to think about it. In less than a minute, the storm was upon us. In less than two, the sky was entirely overcast. And what with this and the driving spray, it became suddenly so dark that we could not see each other in the smack. Such a hurricane as then blew, it is folly to attempt describing. The oldest seamen in Norway never experienced anything like it. We had let our sails go by the run before it cleverly took us. But at the first puff, both our masts went by the board as if they had been sawed off, the mainmast taking with it my youngest brother, who had lashed himself to it for safety. Our boat was the lightest feather of a thing that ever sat upon the water. It had a complete flush deck with only a small hatch near the bow, and this hatch it had always been our custom to batten down when about to cross the strum, by way of precaution against the chopping seas. But for this circumstance, we should have foundered at once, for we lay entirely buried for some moments. How my elder brother escaped destruction I cannot say, for I never had an opportunity of ascertaining. For my part, as soon as I had let the foresail run, I threw myself flat on the deck with my feet against the narrow gunwale of the bow, and with my hands grasping a ring bolt near the foot of the foremast. It was mere instinct that prompted me to do this, for which undoubtedly was the very best thing I could have done, for I was too much flurried to think. For some moments we were completely deluged, as I say, and all the time I held my breath and clung to the bolt. When I could stand it no longer, I raised myself upon my knees, still keeping hold with my hands, and thus got my head clear. Presently our little boat gave herself a shake, just as a dog does in coming out of the water, and thus rid herself in some measure of the seas. I was now trying to get the better of the stupor that had come over me, and to collect my senses so as to see what was to be done, when I felt somebody grasp my arm. It was my elder brother, and my heart leaped for joy, for I made sure that he was overboard. But in the next moment, all this joy was turned to terror, for he put his mouth close to my ear and screamed out the word, Muskostrum. No one ever will know what my feelings were at that moment. I shook from head to foot as if I had had the most violent fit of the ague. I knew what he meant by that one word well enough. I knew what he wished to make me understand. With the wind that now drove us on, we were bound for the whirl of the strong, and nothing could save us. You perceive that in crossing the Strom Channel, we always went a long way up above the world, even in the calmest weather, and then had to wait and watch carefully for the slack. But now we were driving right upon the pool itself, and in such a hurricane as this. To be sure, I thought, we shall get there just about the slack. There is some little hope in that. But in the next moment, I cursed myself for being so great a fool as to dream of hope at all. I knew very well that we were doomed. We had been ten times a ninety-gun ship. By this time, the first fury of the tempest had spent itself, or perhaps we did not feel it so much, as we scuttled before it, but at all events the seas, which had first been kept down by the wind and lay flat and frothing, now got up into absolute mountains. A singular change, too, had come over the heavens. Around in every direction, it was still black as pitch, but nearly overhead there burst out, all at once, a circular rift of clear sky, as clear as I ever saw, and with a deep bright blue, and through it there blazed forth the full moon with a luster that I never before knew her to wear. She lit up everything about us with the greatest distinctness, but oh God! What a scene it was to light up! I now made one or two attempts to speak to my brother, 
but in some manner which I could not understand, the din had so increased that I could not make him hear a single word, although I screamed at the top of my voice in his ear. Presently, he shook his head, looking as pale as death, and held up one of his finger, as if to say, Listen. At first I could not make out what he meant, but soon a hideous thought flashed upon me. I dragged my watch from its fob. It was not going. I glanced at its face by the moonlight and then burst into tears as I flung it far away into the ocean. It had run down at seven o'clock. We were behind the time of the slack, and the whirl of the strom was in full fury. When a boat is well built, properly trimmed, and not deep laden, the waves in a strong gale, when she is going large, seem always to slip from beneath her, which appears very strange to a landsman. And this is what is called riding in a sea phrase. Well, so far we had ridden the swells very cleverly, but presently a gigantic sea happened to take us right under the counter and bore us with it as it rose up up as if into the sky. I would not have believed that any wave could rise so high. And then down we came with a sweep, a slide, and a plunge that made me feel sick and dizzy, as if I was falling from some lofty mountaintop in a dream. But while we were up, I had thrown a quick glance around, and that one glance was all sufficient. I saw our exact position in an instant. The Moskostrom Whirlpool was about a quarter of a mile dead ahead, but no more like the everyday Moskostrom than the whirl as you now see it is like a mill race. If I had not known where we were and what we had to expect, I should not have recognized the place at all. As it was, as it was, I involuntarily closed my eyes in horror. The lids clenched themselves together as if in a spasm. It could not have been more than two minutes afterward until we suddenly felt the waves subside and were enveloped in foam. The boat made a sharp half-turn larboard and then shot off in its new direction like a thunderbolt. At the same moment, the roaring noise of the water was completely drowned in a kind of shrill shriek, such a sound as you might imagine given out by the waste pipes of many thousand steam vessels letting off their steam altogether. We were now in the belt of surf that always surrounds the world, and I thought, of course, that another moment would plunge us into the abyss, down which we could only see indistinctly on account of the amazing velocity with which we were borne along. The boat did not seem to sink into the water at all, but to skim like an air bubble upon the surface of the surge. Her starboard side was next to the world, and on the larboard arose the world of ocean we had left. It stood like a huge writhing wall between us and the horizon. It may appear strange, but now when we were in the very jaws of the gulf, I felt more composed than when we were only approaching it. Having made up my mind to hope no more, I got rid of a great deal of that terror which unmanned me at first. I suppose it was despair that strung my nerves. It may look like boasting, but what I tell you is truth. I began to reflect how magnificent a thing it was to die in such a manner, and how foolish it was in me to think of so paltry a consideration as my own individual life in view of so wonderful a manifestation of God's power. I do believe I blushed with shame when this idea crossed my mind. After a little while, I became possessed with the keenest curiosity about the world itself. I positively felt a wish to explore its depths, even at the sacrifice I was going to make, and my principal grief was that I should never be able to tell my old companions on shore about the mysteries I should see. These no doubt were singular fancies to occupy a man's mind in such extremity, and I have often thought since that the revolutions of the boat around the pool might have rendered me a little light-headed. There was another circumstance which tended to restore my self-possession, and this was the cessation of the wind, which could not reach us in our present situation, for as you saw yourself, the belt of surf is considerably lower than the general bed of the ocean, 
and this ladder now towered above us, a high, black, mountainous ridge. If you have never been at sea in a heavy gale, you can form no idea of the confusion of mind occasioned by the wind and spray together. They blind, deafen, and strangle you and take away all power of action or reflection. But we were now, in a great measure, rid of these annoyances. Just us death-condemned felons in prison are allowed petty indulgences, forbidden them while their doom is yet uncertain. How often we made the circuit of the belt is impossible to say. We careered round and round for perhaps an hour, flying rather than floating, getting gradually more and more into the middle of the surge, and then nearer and nearer to its horrible inner edge. All this time, I had never let go of the ring bolt. My brother was at the stern, holding on to a small empty water cask, which had been securely latched under the coop of the counter, and was the only thing on deck that had not been swept overboard when the gale first took us. As we approached the brink of the pit, he let go his hold upon this and made for the ring, from which, in the agony of his terror, he endeavored to force my hands, as it was not large enough to afford us both a secure grasp. I never felt deeper grief than when I saw him attempt this act, although I knew he was a madman when he did it, a raving maniac through sheer fright. I did not care, however, to contest the point with him. I knew it would make no difference whether either of us held on at all, so I let him have the bolt and went astern to the cask. This there was no great difficulty in doing, for the smack flew around steadily enough and upon an even keel, only swaying to and fro with the immense sweeps and swelters of the world. Scarcely had I secured myself in my new position when we gave a wild lurch to starboard and rushed headlong into the abyss. I muttered a hurried prayer to God and thought all was over.